Praise the Lord. Can we give God a great clap offering also? He's just worthy. At my age, I'm a digital alien. It's about the thing I can do is open my iPad. Okay. Please keep me in your prayers. As Dan told you, I pastor he and Kayla. As you might imagine, she's easy, he's hard. Please pray for me. Okay. It's so great to be here in Midland. I've been coming here maybe 30 years, Pastor Dan. And um, you say, why do you come to Midland? Honestly, I want to get away from the hot weather of Tennessee and come where it's cooler, balmy breezes, sandy beaches. And so um, but I've been coming to Midland many, many years. Honestly, I love it here. I confess I especially love your food. I know you can't tell. I love Tex-Mex, Texas barbecue, Texas steak. Anyway, really great to be here. Um, um, many of you I know and have been around, some not. Um, I sent the team here a message on Thursday, and by Friday morning I had a new one. And um, I was in my prayer time, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. Dan alluded to the fact that I'm prophetic, and what that means is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that operates me is I get impressions on people, world events, and um, over these years, some of them I'll share with you. I'm going to entitle this message. I've not only never preached this message, my opening passage of Scripture, which we'll get to in Psalms, I've never, ever preached out of. So, and I've been preaching 50 years, you go, how can that be? You look 30. Well, give or take 38, nine years, roughly. That's a great guess. Okay. Holy Spirit, I thank you for my Mid-Cities family. Thank you for Pastor Dan and Kayla. They're like blood to me. I just think of Pastor Chris, Leslie, so many leaders here that I've known and walk with decades now. I thank you for the privilege of spiritual family. Speak to us, Lord, amen. How many of you know America's at a pretty critical place right now? Raise your hand. Regardless of your political views and whatever you say, America's soul is hurting. We look around the world, there's a lot of darkness and I've been to multiple nations in the world and major war in Europe. I'll never forget in October 2022, speaking to our leader of Ukraine, I looked at him and said, I want you to know Russia's gonna come and invade you. You're not to be afraid. You watch what God does. Sitting in my office last year in February before the invasion started, next week, God said, by the way, next week Russia's gonna invade Ukraine. Don't be afraid. Army's not gonna do well. It'll end up worse for them than Afghanistan. I love Russia, been there. I've worked with about 1,900 churches there in a prayer movement, but don't be afraid. I know it's dark right now. I know America's polarized right now. I know people are hurting. And if you think you're hurting, you ought to try to lead America. They're just as afraid as you are. I'm gonna entitle this message from fretting. It's an interesting word used four times in the Old Testament to faith. Living as light in this dark hour. You know, it's easy to want to find someone to save us. And I appreciate voting. It's an American freedom. I vote my conscience. You say, well, well like, like, who do you support? Jesus. I mean, I'll vote, I'm political, but I'm not partisan about anyone but Jesus because he's our hope. Beloved, the government's not going to save you. You say, well, maybe not this iteration. No iteration is. Some are better than others. I vote my biblical conscience. I've ministered to a number of America's key political leaders. 
I'll never forget my first foray into the government. Was, I was younger, was right before the Gulf War, the Lord had showed me the Gulf War coming and I'd gotten that to the White House. And so I heard back, phone rang. He was the second most powerful woman in the world for sure. Best friends with the president's wife. They were Texans at that time. No wonder we were well run. And she said, Jim, I'm calling to pray with you. My husband and the president are scared to death. They don't know what to do. There in my early 30s, that scared me a bit. I just was still living under the guise. Maybe they knew what to do. The real hope of the world is the church. It just is. It's simple. The Bible says we're the light of the world. Let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about what we're facing. I want to talk just for a second about our moment in history. I normally stand and preach these last couple of years. I sat because I don't really want to preach to you. I want to talk to you. In Acts 3, 19 through 20, Peter is preaching and he introduces an interesting concept to us. He says, listen, you need to repent. Turn back that your sins may be blotted out. We get that. Get saved. And he says, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Christ. That means in between now and the second coming of Christ, you go, when's that coming? Beats me. I mean, the Bible said we were in the last hour. That was 2,000 years ago. It's the longest hour in history. I mean, the last days. I mean, I just, all I, but in between now and then, there have been unique times where God's presence is more manifest. Precious lost men and women feel it. Christians are renewed. And America's had her fair share of what we're calling times of refreshing. In fact, at every critical juncture in American history, there have been unique moments. Some call them religious awakenings. Some call them outpourings. Uh, some call them revivals. And maybe you grew up in a church where you had revival and that meant someone came to preach at you real hard for three days. I'm not talking about someone coming to church. I'm talking about God coming to church in a powerful way. But before our Revolutionary War, First Great Awakening, before the Civil War, Second Great Awakening, right before the Civil War, a prayer movement that swept through the North, started by a man named Jeremiah Lampier in every city, spontaneous prayer meetings. That revival can swept all the way through the Civil War. So throughout our history, before World War I, World War II, a massive revival exploded in Los Angeles under a, an African-American pastor named William Seymour. Later, I mean, we came out of World War II, going into the Cold War, another revival rippled through us. There in the 60s and 70s, when the country so polarized over the Vietnam War, I mean, I was part of that. Some call it the Jesus Revolution. There's a movie about that now. Some of you have probably seen it. What was that like? Well, I was in a very secular high school in San Diego, and my high school felt like church felt today. God just showed up. Hundreds of kids were saved. It became the thing to do. Now, we've come to such a moment in time like that. And I'm going to give you some impressions or revelation I've received from the Lord. But then I want to give you some observation you can see with your own eyes. I'm going to be very quick here because I want to get into the heart of the message. As Pastor Daniel knows, back December 31st, 2018, I was preaching under Happy New Year's Eve service at Bethel. One of Pastor Dan's dear friends, James Lowe, pastors that. He and his wife are African-American. We have a multi-site, multi-ethnic church, that site being um, predominantly African-American. I've been on the board there, elder there for decades, preached there a few times a year. And they always asked me to do the New Year's Eve service. This was going to go from the happy New Year's Eve to the unhappy New Year's Eve. I was sitting on the front row and I had a series of impressions of the Holy Spirit. Five minutes before I started preaching, I saw America torn. 
I saw people begin to move out of the West Coast like a flood east. I saw New York swamp with terrible things. I saw our economy shattered, people crying out for help. And I saw that within 18 months, we'd come to a time of deep ethnic pain and polarization. Of course, 18 months from then is when Mr. Floyd was killed. And I stood up on that Happy New Year's Eve service and told them all those things. So it was recorded. Now here's how I ended. America's gonna get so polarized, people are gonna wonder if we're gonna divide. They're gonna wonder if we're gonna go into anarchy, but no, God's gonna visit America and hundreds and thousands of people are gonna be saved. That's all recorded. May 18th and 19th, as Pastor Dan knows, I was so burdened for America. I was into the mountains praying and the Lord said, Jim, really, on the May 18th, he told me a real hard time's coming to your country, Jim. America's gonna become dangerous. I thought, will I live in Franklin? Should I wear orange in my car? Is some hunter gonna shoot me? Like dangerous in Franklin, Tennessee? Like saying it's dangerous in Midland. He goes, no, Jim, great dangers coming to America and the world. The next morning, I'll never forget it. It's the only one I didn't make public, just told a few pastor friends because I didn't know what it meant at the time. It wasn't until COVID I did. I saw a terrifying, swarming river of death come out of the nation of China and go to every nation in the world. I wrote it in my journal. The river of death will flow to every nation. It will go killing and bringing death and woe. That was COVID. I was involved in a prayer movement and I guess hundreds of millions of people joined around the world. But all during that time, I realized it's really dark, but the light of God is greater than darkness. We're gonna come out of a dark period into a flash of divine light. It was June 9th, 2022. I guess I get these impressions from the Holy Spirit, it's kind of in the Bible. And um, as I was praying, it was like, like I could see in a, my, on my screen of my imagination, Jesus talking to his father. We know the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. He was saying one more time, one more time, one more time. Father said one more time. I thought, what one more time? And the presence of God just to come like raindrops. Since that time, churches everywhere are feeling new life. The church you're in right now is growing and growing and growing. That's going to continue. People you never thought would come to Christ are going to. You, you're, you, you won't just get out of space. That's going to be a, a problem in the next few years. A wonderful problem. August 24th, I was in Birmingham, Alabama to see a dear friend and I laid down thinking, Lord, are you really going to revive the earth? Like, what are you going to do? And Daniel will remember me telling him this. And um, I saw the UK. And no one knew the queen was sick. And everyone in the UK was crying. And all the flags were at half mask. I said, my gosh, what's died in the UK? But I had this glimpse of Jesus pulling the Union Jack back and saying, I've not forgotten England, Jim. Don't be afraid. My glory's come. I'm getting ready to do something. I'm going to do something in the world. I go, what does that mean? A week later, still not realizing the queen was sick, the Lord said, when the queen dies, that's a sign to you that I'm going to pour my spirit out. <sighs> Last thought, then I'll give you a couple observations and we'll dive into this message. It's February 3rd, 2023. Um, we turned our mother-in-law suite in the garage into an office for me. We're empty nesters, at least in this iteration. All my many kids have fooled me sometimes because they're like boomerangs. I cast them out into the job and they, you ever have that happen to you? You're an empty nester for two weeks and all of a sudden your nest is full again. <laughs> We've made it two years this time, but we're still wondering. Okay, anyway. All of a sudden, I was looking at my world map. I saw these, when you get thunderstorms in Midland, they're mostly in the south because of the humidity content and all. And the Lord said, thunderstorms of my spirit and power are coming over America. Get ready. A few days later, Asbury, we have an Every Nation church very close to there. That little school in a town of 3,000 became the center of the spiritual world. 
over the next three weeks. It was hit a million times on TikTok, revival. Thousands of people came. Final weekend, 20,000 people, cars lined up two and a half miles wide. In a room not much bigger than this, nowhere near this fancy, with wooden pews, God came and no one wanted to go home. His presence was so thick, people came from 50 other countries. Let me give you an observation. All over America, God's presence is manifesting. All over the country, the first wave of this is coming. One of the great statisticians, Daniel and I follow church statisticians, said among high school, junior high students and college students, there's the greatest openness to spiritual things there's been in 50 years. How do we respond to this? What does that mean to you and I? I think we must choose whether we're going to have faith for a fresh move of God and be a part of it. Or are we going to fret away a divine moment of opportunity? Psalms 37, 1 through 8, there's a word from the Hebrew translated into the English, fret. It's used three times. And it's also used in the book of Proverbs. Don't fret because of evildoers. Um, he'll bring forth your righteousness like the light. Fret, fret not yourselves when evil people prosper. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. Fret's a very powerful word in the archaic English. It means something's eating away at you on the inside. In the Hebrew, it's a word that speaks of anger, deep anxiety, getting red in the face. But typically, fretting is worry on steroids. It's a worry that makes you angry and eats your faith away, eats your confidence away, makes you worried about your family. And right now, the church is filled with fretters. That's not a grammatical word, but I'm using it. We've all fretted. And at the very root of our fretting, which is eating away our faith, is helplessness. We feel helpless to shift our country. We feel helpless at times to protect our children. When I, when I read, raised kids, there, was, there weren't even cell phones starting out. There were barely computers. There was no social media. It was easy to shelter them. But now, evil is ubiquitous. It's just everywhere. We fear for our kids. We fear for our country. No matter where you are in the political spectrum, you feel failed at one level or another. And helplessness and hopelessness breed fretting and anger. I don't care how many guns you have. My old drill sergeant would kill me. We couldn't call them guns. Back in the day, I jumped out of airplanes and did lots of crazy things. Shot expert with all kinds of weapons. I was an instructor on rifle ranges, pistol ranges. I got more guns scattered in my house than an arsenal. But you know some Don't make me feel any safer. Because what scares us is not really tangible. It's spiritual. It's ideological. But today I want to help you turn from fretting to faith. I want to let you know, once again, God has come to the age of our nation. He only lacks one thing, you. Let me spell out our mandate for you. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. That's scary. Now we knew, how many of you know Jesus was the light of the world? And as long as he was here, that was true. The good news is he's in heaven praying for you. The bad news is he isn't here, it's you. His light in you is the hope of the world. It says this, 
in Isaiah 61 through three, speaking prophetically of the church, arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This describes our day. Darkness will cover the earth, thick darkness to people. Have you realized dark darkness is almost tangible right now? We live in a day when our good is called evil. Like we believe in preserving human life even before, even as a fetus. And that's called evil now. We believe in the Bible's view of marriage. That's come evil now. And I'm tender to those that don't believe that. There's nothing God can't touch and redeem. But darkness is around us. It suffocates us. It worries us about our kids. But it says in John 1, 4, and 5, in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome. I love New Mexico. Growing up, we'd stop in Carlsbad Caverns, like the biggest caverns in America. they turn the lights off. Pitch black. Sticks in. And they'd light a match. Jesus said, Jesus came into the world, and this is what we learned. Darkness can't overcome light. It is impossible. The darker it gets, the more the light shines. The darker it gets, the brighter it becomes. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 said, the very God that said, let, there, let light shine out of darkness. The very God that initiated the creation of the world. We have all kinds of people viewing the world different ways here. Maybe some of you are creationists. Maybe you're theistic evolutionists. Maybe you're just an evolutionist. But let me tell you, the Bible is clear about one thing. The processes that began this world were initiated by the word of God. And he said, let there be light. And that same God whose creative word initiated this world has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of, what's that mean? He can speak light into the darkest situations. He can speak light into the darkest broken marriage, the most hurting soul, the deepest abuse, the darkest shame, all the fear. And he's chosen to use your mouth to speak it. What is our model? How can we cooperate with God in this hour? John 5, 32 through 35, Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. He says, there's another person who bears witness about me. I'll ad lib here. The testimony is true. You sent to John and he witnessed to who I am. Not that I really need human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning, shining lamp. And you rejoiced in that light for a while. May I say, if you do not burn, you cannot shine. If God wanted to ignite you, what would he do? If God wanted to ignite you into a bright gospel light, what would he do? How would that happen? How would he make that happen? Matthew 3, 11 is interesting. John the Baptist is looking prophetically at this Messiah who would come and he says this, I water baptize you with repentance, but there's someone coming after me, speaking of Jesus, who's mightier than me. I can't even carry his shoes around. He will immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. When you were born again, Jesus came to live in you through the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that? My Father and I will be in you. Through the Holy Spirit, you were, he lives in you. As we submit to him, we're continually filled with his Spirit. 
Many of us have been baptized in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. May I tell you, that's the fuel. That's the oil. The Holy Spirit's not a force, he's a person, but his anointing provides the fuel we need to burn. Burning, shining. But what ignites it? What will it take to ignite the anointing of the Holy Spirit? What will it take to fan it into flames? Like God, like Paul told Timothy. What will it take not to quench the Spirit's fire in your life as we're commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5? It says in the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4. And these were the people in the upper room we know at least 11 of them, Jesus had already said, breathed on it and said, be filled with the Spirit. And if Jesus breathes you and tells you to be filled, something's happened. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a wind. You've been in some big winds. Some of you've been in tornadoes, I have. I, I, I've been chased by them cross country. They've rolled over my house like a train and ravaged the neighborhood and spared us. You know, that wind just howls. A tornado of God's spirit came into that room. The wind of the Holy Spirit flooded into their lives. But on top of every one of them was a fire. God wants to ignite you. You know why? You're the light of the world. The church is God's answer. Paul says something pretty powerful. It's not even in front of me, but I'll share it with you. He says, you were darkness, now you're children of light. What's that mean? He didn't say you were in darkness. He said, you were darkness. All of us at one point, before we knew Christ, we were part of the very fabric at one level or another that now chokes people. But we're mired in things. What keeps us from shining, beloved? I've been preaching 50 years. <laughs> Traveled millions of miles. Been close to, gone close to 5,000 nights from home the last 30 years been all over the world. I've been before dictators, imams, terrorists, the poorest of the poor. What mires us? What keeps us from living as light? I have four points there. I'm going to allude to them. One, baskets. You're the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says. You're a city set in a hill. People don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. In the Bible, it's a bushel basket, like you carry harvest and fruit in. You put it on a stand. In the Bible, the church is the lamp stand. What keeps us from putting our light and being committed to a local church? What covers it up? Sometimes our lack of Christian character covers up the light. It's one thing to talk about Christ. It's a whole other matter to live for Christ, isn't it? It takes discipleship, the word, a whole other matter. The churches, unfortunately, put a lot of their light under the bushel basket of political power. I believe in voting my conscience, beloved. I thank God for the right of an American to vote. I encourage you to vote your scriptural conscience. But my hope's not in political power. I'm only partisan about Jesus. But we've put a bushel basket over our light. Some of us think maybe we're monks. We'll just run away and hide and hope it gets better. Then there's the battles. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 said, if our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world blinds them, blinds the minds of those who don't know Christ to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. 
Do you believe in the devil? I do. It's in the Bible. Do you believe in demons? Heck yes. Fallen angels in the Bible. And the enemy so fears the light in you. He does everything he can to blind your friends and your neighbors who don't yet know him. Blindness. A lot of us have gone a bit blind. The Bible says, your eye is the lamp of the body. So whatever you focus on fills you. If your eye is healthy, looking at the right thing, not sick, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye's bad, your whole body's full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, that's great. May I tell you, whatever you focus on fills you. We all know, okay, I know terrible things like pornography are wrong. Okay, that's obvious. Do you focus on bad news or good news? Do you spend more of your time on your chosen news site or in the good news of God's word? Mm. If you live on news sites, news sites, you're despairing or angry. I follow a couple things. I won't say which ones. I find a lot of news sites seem like propaganda to me, to be honest. They want to they always sensationalize everything to get you to look. I spend more time in the good news than the bad news. How about you? What you focus on, that's why the Bible is so important to you. Because it says, the entrance of my word bringeth light. It says, my word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light. That's why I read the word, meditate on the word, confess the word. It ignites the Holy Spirit in me. It ignites the power of God in me. It ignites it. Some of us have burned out. We have a fuel shortage. This is a profound parable. The story of the 10 virgins. The kingdom of God is like 10 virgins. That means virgin hereby is an analogy. They were pure. I mean, they weren't like living a sinful life. They all took their lamps to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were dumb, five were wise. The foolish took their lamp, their lies, but no extra oil. They'd never really been deeply filled with his spirit. Never been immersed in his power. It's the analogy here. As the bridegroom was delayed, and I might add, you know, okay, Jesus, Jesus has seemingly been delayed a couple thousand years. We were at the last hour 2,000 years ago, Pastor Dan. That's the longest hour in human history. He's coming. But he was delayed. They all got a little drowsy and slept. At midnight, there was the cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Midnight is an hour in the Bible, which basically says this, a new day is dawned, it's still too dark to see. And time and time again, Jesus in his many comings of renewal and refreshing comes at midnight. It's dark, it's scary, everything seems to be over. But a new day will dawn for us. Come and meet him. All the virgins came, trimmed their lamps, trimmed their wicks. They were ignited. The foolish said, man, we're out of oil, Pastor Dan. We're out of oil, Pastor Chris. We're out of oil, Kayla. We're out of oil, Leslie. We're just out of oil. He said, listen up. I'm sorry. You should have been storing up. I'm sorry. A great moment's come into the church. But those that have never really been deeply filled with the Spirit, they're facing as much darkness as those that don't even know him. Jesus begged his disciples in John 12. It's not in the notes. Then I'm going to give my last verse and summarize. He said this. He said, it's going to get real dark. He was speaking of his crucifixion and all that. Guys, it's going to get real dark. It's going to get so dark you can't see. But if you'll listen to me now, if you'll just walk in the light now, <clears throat> if you'll just be flooded with the light now, you'll be sons and daughters of light. And no matter how dark it gets, you'll see. 
I close with this verse and summarize. 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. For this reason, I might admire, for all the reasons I've given you, it's dark. You're the light. Do not fret. Do not let worry extinguish your faith. Don't let anger crush your faith. It only leads to evil. It says if we don't fret, our righteousness will shine like a light. For this reason, I say to you today, fan in to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now we know in the Bible, as Pastor Dan has taught you, there's a powerful gifting and baptism of the spirit that comes with the laying on of hands. Paul said, Timothy, fan it. How do you fan it? Every time you read the word, you fan it. Every time you come to church, you fan it. Every time you worship, you fan it. Every time you invite some of the church, I'm not good with words. God's moving on your friends, don't be afraid. You fan it. Every time we reach out, we fan it. I say this to you now, fan it to flame. Darkness is always God's greatest canopy. Paul says this, you live in a twisted generation. Don't be afraid. I've called you to shine like stars in the darkness. Be honest, don't raise your hand. Have you ever gotten really angry like me about what you see in our country? You ever gotten mad? Have you ever wanted to call politicians names? I learned about 30 years ago, I better, I, I, whoever's president, whether I like them or not, I'm gonna pray for them every night. Because I don't bless them, I may end up cursing them. <laughs> they had to pray for Nero. Now listen to me. If you want the Lord to pull you out of fretting and freshly touch you with the Holy Spirit, you say, Pastor, I don't want to fret. I need Jesus to increase my faith and touch me. Raise your hand and wave it at me. Put him up so I can see him. You're all over the room. Stand up. I'm going to pray for you right now. You need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to fret. Pastor Daniel's joining me up now. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I turn from fretting. I turn from anxiety. I turn from fear. I turn from anger. Light is greater than darkness. Light cannot overcome darkness. Freshly fill me with your spirit. Freshly immerse me in your power. Ignite the fires of your spirit in me. I receive your fresh filling. I receive your fire. Your glory is going to shine upon your church. Those in the thickest darkness have seen the light. Before I tell it to Dan, I travel a lot. I was a mom and they live under communist oppression. I was there a few weeks ago. And when you get feeling helpless, the very people you're called to love, you judge them out of a defense mechanism. I can walk through the airports just so broken by what I see. But when Jesus came into Jerusalem, knowing they were going to murder him, and all the adoring crowds would betray him, and every one of his best friends would leave him. He wasn't filled with hatred for those who would kill him. Didn't just have all the little names that defined them. He cried, and he cried, and he cried. I've asked the Holy Spirit to break my heart over those in darkness. I make it my business to reach out all the time 
It's an honor to be here. I have great hope for this city with you here.